vital things in worship. When you sing, but aren't paying attention to what you're singing. Like I think to myself, how many people have sang the song, I've seen him move the mountains, but they've never seen him move the mountains. You know what I mean? And this song, It Is Well With My Soul, that's more of a faith worship song. If, you, if everything's going well with you, you see what I mean? It's, it's you know, in the valley. See, you really understand his presence, not on the top, but in the valley. Because you're not looking for it on the top, but you need it in the valley. You need it on the top as well. Pastor Victor, I don't know if I ever shared this with you, but there was a, a, a service we had when our stage was over there, and I remember coming out, and my ears were ringing really bad. I couldn't hear. My, I don't know what was wrong, and it was distracting me. The enemy always tries to distract you. And I remember a lot of things were going on and people were saying a lot of things, which wasn't at the time really anything new, still isn't, but it just, it was, I was bothered. And I remember when they were singing that song, I just lifted both of my hands and by faith I said, it is well, it is well with my soul, meaning you can, you can try all that you will. You can come against me. You can, you know, there's things going on in your life. The devil, he, 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 he pays close attention to your facial expressions. But when you're beating somebody and they're continuing to say, it is well, it torments the tormentor. And I'm telling you tonight, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, the devil know tonight it is well with my soul you won't get the best of me he got the best of me and is developing me to be like him it is well with my soul did you lose your job it is well with my soul did someone in your family die it is still well within my soul in Jesus name it is a declaration so everybody can sing the same words but receive something different isn't that strange how everybody tonight will hear the same word but they won't hear the same word when you don't hear God's word through the ears of faith, you don't hear it. And so tonight, the Lord wants you before you receive the word. It's hard to receive when you can't say it's well. I know what it is for the enemy to attack you when you're being preached to or when you're reading the word. And if the devil can distort your father's image, you won't want to talk to your father. And tonight I'm telling you, I don't care what they said. I don't care what the report was. I don't care what the diagnosis was. I don't care what your bank account says. If you can rise up in faith tonight and say it is well, it is well that God is going to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all I could ask or think in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Look at 
at your neighbor before you sit down and say, every day is Pentecostal Sunday. You can sit down in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, we serve a good God. And I want to say that tonight, as I've been saying, you're going to see a building upon building upon building. You're not going to see... When, when, when God's spirit moves, hunger begets hunger, right? And there, you can act, I've, I've seen people, they, they can act hungry, but they're full. I've seen people act spiritual, and they're of the devil, right? Isn't that something? Hunger begets hunger. When you're hungry, you are looking to eat. See? I mean, when I get hungry, I mean, and I, and I do quite a bit, I'm looking for something to eat. And so tonight, we're going to keep building in the name of Jesus. And I want to say what an awesome word Pastor Perky gave last night in the house. Amen. And tomorrow night, one of my, my little brothers is going to be here. And I'm telling you, you better bring your dancing shoes. Don't wear a watch. <laughs> bring your dancing shoes. Because when we get together, we don't care about nobody else. We'll just shout all day long in Jesus' name. See, the thing is, I'm not shouting for just something to do. I'm shouting so I can survive in Jesus' name. If I don't shout, I'll die. You see what I mean? And sometimes you got to understand there's different kinds of shouting. There's proclaiming, there's, de there's declaring, but the one that a lot of people don't like is rebuking. You know what I mean? It's amazing to call the things that are not as though they were, but don't call what the devil shows you as something different. That's what it is. See, he'll, he'll, he'll come and say, well, call what I'm bringing different. No, that's what it is. You're of the devil because you are the devil. Not talking to you, I'm talking about the devil. <laughs> Psalms 23. We're going to go around quite a few verses tonight. And it starts off, which this isn't my main passage. This is the calamari verse of this evening. <laughs> the Lord is my, my shepherd. We were talking about the whole concept of sheep being dumb, which is ludicrous. They're not dumb. Look it up. We actually had this, this debate in my office the other day. And sheep stick up for each other. So if that's dumb, I want to hang around dumb people. But it's funny how we, we will label sheep as dumb, but yet Jesus calls himself a lamb. But he's also our shepherd. You see, he's laid his life down for the sheep. The Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. Or your translation says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside still waters, restores my soul. Okay, so that's New King James. I'm reading New Living Translation. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. See, it's hard to drink if the stream's not peaceful, right? He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Your translation might say, for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I'll not be afraid. For you're close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a little meal for me. So that's why you got to bring your Bibles. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my friends. No, no, no way. We're going to get rowdy tonight. See, why would the Lord prepare a feast for you? 
in the presence of your enemies. Why would he do that? Because you would, I think this world would deem that as cruel. But what this world views as cruel in God's kingdom is justice. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies, meaning that God's going to put his stamp of approval on you in front of those who have disqualified you. Well, you honor me by anointing my head with oil. That's very vital. This keeps the flies away. Satan is Lord of the flies, Beelzebub. My cup overflows with blessing. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me. Now, why is God's love and his goodness pursuing you? Well, it's because you're pursuing him and goodness follows him. All the days of my life and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Now, even though I walk in verse 4 through the darkest valley, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I like that translation better. I will fear no evil. You'll never know his power until you know your valley. Isn't it funny that everybody wants to live on the mountain even though they're faking it most of their life? And they don't want to accept their valley, and if they don't want to accept their valley, they can't admit there is a redeemer that wants to help them out of their valley. Everybody wants to get through their valley with their own means and their own tools, but you can't have pride and get through the valley. You'll get stuck in the valley. Because pride says, I can get out. Pride says, I can make it through. But you can't. You'll get through, and the devil will deceive you that you're out of the valley, but you're actually in a deeper one. Now, check this out. Has God ever put a promise in your heart, given you something, told you something? You wrote it down. You told it to some people. You got excited about it when you heard it. But time killed that excitement. The word's still there. The promise is still there. But your remembrance of it is not. Has he ever given you a promise? If God, when God says something to me, and you got to be careful when you say the Lord said something to me. I'm very careful when I tell people, you know, God told me. But when I know God told me, I'll say God told me, and no matter what they say, well, you just sit back and eat your popcorn and watch. It's going to happen. And so this is what's interesting. When God tells you something, the only person that can forfeit the blessing he's put on your life is you. And so God gives you a promise. He puts it in your heart. And have you ever asked yourself, has, has God ever, ever, have you ever just brought to your remembrance, has, has, has God ever asked you to step out in faith because that's the promise. you got to step out in faith to receive it. But every time God gives you a promise, he never tells you how to get to it in the beginning. And you'll get all these questions. And you'll wonder. See, God, he gave you a plan. It's 50 pages, but he only gave you half of page one. I remember standing before the Lenexa City Council when we were getting in this building. And they said, what are your plans? I said, well, this is literally what I said. I know God has a plan for me and the church that he's called me to plant. I can't tell you that entire plan because for some reason he won't show it to me. But I'm going to keep following. See, if he gave you all the pages, you probably would ditch him. Oh, I got it. I'm good. You know what I mean? Isn't it amazing how affectionate you are from somebody you want something from, but the moment you get it, you are not affectionate anymore? You see? Like, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> but, but what I didn't know 
when I started Nexus Church was that 93% of church plants fail. I didn't know that. I didn't know that 89% of church plants, marriages end in divorce. Didn't know that. And you know what? I didn't care to know it. Because the people that give you those statistics aren't telling you that 93% of those people weren't called to start a church. For him that he calls, he equips. Right? Now check this out. What I didn't know when I started Nexus Church was that in the midst of planting, the enemy was busy sending people into my fields to plant weeds amongst the seed that I've placed in the ground. Have you ever put seed in the ground just to watch some knuckleheads come and plant weeds amongst your coming harvest? I didn't know that. See, you think that what God has called you to do, everybody's going to celebrate, but they will not tolerate. And so I didn't know that. And when you plant seeds of faith that produce a fruitful harvest, see, we always talk about the planting of the seed, and then we talk about the harvest. For some reason, no one talks about the time in between. See, everybody wants to talk about soaring. I'm an eagle, I soar, but that's not how it works. The eagle, the mom, pushes the eaglet out of the nest. And he flaps its wings in hysteria to learn how to fly. That would seem cruel, but he would have never learned how to fly if he didn't get moved out of the nest. You would never know who you were if the weeds weren't planted. It's interesting. Now check it. Because you will discover that many times there will be destructive weeds planted in the midst of your harvest and they're there to destroy your advancement. I was talking with a great friend today, and he mentioned that some Christians, and I stopped him and I said, you mean so-called Christians. That's what Paul called them. He goes, you so-called Christians. That's what we in, the, in today, the John Perky translation calls fake ID Christians. Right? That's the street version. It's the... Compton International Version coming out soon. <laughs> Comes with a free air freshener. <laughs> but I've thought of this, and I've thought about how many times, you know, I have seed in the ground. And we forget not only how cruel people can be, but you need to understand that we, we not wrestle against flesh and blood, but the enemy works through flesh and blood. Just as the Holy Spirit empowers us, the enemy empowers other people to do his work. This is the big difference as we talk about many times, what usually causes people to vomit at the mouth. You have children of God and children of the devil. Oh, no, we're all children of God. No, we're not. Not until you're translated into his marvelous light, right? And so there's a scripture, a parable that I read that helped me and still is helping me today understand because if I could give you a story in the last eight years, even though we've been in church for 10 years, it really was the first eight years where there was constant weed planting amongst what I was trying to plant. And at every turn, when you're trying to advance, there will always be someone trying to choke the word that God has given you. Now check this out, because Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. He said, here is another story. Jesus told, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer. Everybody say farmer. Okay, this farmer planted good seed in his field. You've planted some good seed in your field. But that night, as the worker slept, 
His enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. The enemy always works in stealth mode. Because have you ever like had someone you've heard has been talking about you, but the moment you see them at the mall, they turn away from you? They're real bold on the keyboard, very shy at Forever 21. I don't go there. There's nothing in there that fits me. When the, when the crop began to grow and produce grain, now, don't get ahead. Because he planted, the enemy came and planted amongst his seed, but he didn't know that it was planted until his harvest began to grow. See, a lot of times people will avoid you and neglect you. They don't see what you have in the ground, but once it starts coming out, they start coming out. When the crop began to grow and produce grains, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and they said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? Well, there was no hesitation in the farmer. He said, An enemy has planted these weeds. See, don't be confused about what the enemy's planting and what God's planting. See, you'll call the weed that God's teaching you, but it's actually sent from the devil to destroy you. Okay? So, an enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out all the weeds? Should we? Should we do it? Should we pull them all off the house? No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do so. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and burn them, and to put the wheat into the barn. Now, We are using this parable in another light. The main emphasis of the parable is to show God's children amongst the world. So I want you to understand that. But it says that when the crop began to grow and produce grains, the weeds also grew. Now, now, when the workers returned to the farmer, what did they say? They said, man, your field where you planted your good seed is full of weeds. Now, notice that they said nothing about the wheat. Because the wheat was there. But they came and gave a negative report of what they only saw. They only saw the weeds, even though there was the wheat. You got to be careful about surrounding yourself with people that all they see is weeds. You do. Because they'll call you and tell you about it how big they are, how long they've been. Now, they only wanted to tell the farmer about the negative aspects of his field. See, the devil wants to distract you, hear me, from what you planted and have you focus on what you didn't plant. I'm going to say it again for the people that have attention deficit disorder, which is all of us. I, I remember when that came out, people would say it, and I'd be like, I've never talked to anybody I've had their full attention all the time. You, just, you know what I mean? You just door shuts, phone rings, huh? What? So, so, so check this out. You have planted good seed in the ground. And what happens is the enemy comes along and he gets you to focus on what he planted. And you forgot about what you planted. 
I don't care who you are. I don't care how smart you think you are. I don't care how much money you have in the bank. Nothing will trump sowing and reaping. If you sow something into the ground, you best believe you're going to reap it. Now, that's good news for some people. But it's not good news for all people. If you did not sow and reap, if you didn't reap what you sowed, then you would never learn that putting bad things in the ground produce bad things in your ground. So no one gets a free pass on this. Have you ever, I'm sure we all have planted things that we wish we hadn't planted. And we reap. And the devil, you know, if the devil can distract you from your seed and get your eyes on the weed, not the dime bag kind, but the weed in the ground <laughs> for all the sticky icky people in here. Mace in the face. Your street terms. Your street terms. I grew up on the street. I was adopted at the age of four. Come from the street. They said they found me in the back of a trunk of a 64 Impala and the hydraulics were going. See, this is what I want to say. If, 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 if you forget what you have in the ground, you'll lose expectation of what you've planted. You think about it. Expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. You know, you hear that? People say that. But check this out. If, if you forget what you have in the ground, you will lose all expectation for the harvest. And then you will expect what you didn't plant. This will help you if you need help. See, the workers, they asked the farmer, should we pull out all the weeds? The farmer said, no, don't do that. If you do that, you will uproot the wheat. He went on to say, we'll sort it out later. When the enemy is trying to attack you and derail your purpose, don't stop what you're doing and focus on it. Know that your father will sort it out later. And when he sorts somebody out, he sorts them out. Trust in him. Trust in him. Now check this out. We'll sort out the weeds after harvest time and burn them up. After harvest time. I like that. Because it takes me back to Psalms 23. If I'm sorting the weeds from the wheat, then the weeds have become a table. Or I'm the table in the presence of the enemies. The weeds are the enemies. So sorting them out, you see what I'm saying? They get to see the blessings of God come this way. The table set, they're the weeds that have now been burnt up in front of the wheat. Isn't it something that we're always trying to get even like Stephen? But your mathematics are wrong. I don't go after people that come after me. There's people in this town that if I told you, you'd lose your mind. And you don't even, you know who they are, probably, but they try and they have tried, and you have people that try to come after you, and the devil wants you to drop everything you're doing. See? See? Because you're in the middle. The devil won't mess with you when you get to the end because he's not going to mess with somebody that went through the mud or the valley. Who's going to turn back and say, why am I going to turn back and go through that again? When you get on the other side of the middle, you don't go back. He'll tempt you in the middle. You see what I'm saying? Ah. Oof. B3 with the Leslie amp. Be nice. 
right about now. That's coming in Jesus' name. <laughs> you know, I was, I'm at the gas station today. You guys have like heard of like metal music? Take that, but with organs and drums and tambourines that fast. That's what I was listening to today at the gas pump. And boy, when people pull up, they look at you. And every now and then I'll just, oh, oh, what, what, what? Let's go get some chicken strips. Now, 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 now. When God gives you a promise and tells you to plant, the worst thing you can do is freak out when the weeds show up. They will show up and they will have faces. But the moment you begin to worry about the weeds is the moment you choke out the seed you planted. You remember when Jesus said the seed fell amongst thorny ground, representing the, the cares, the worries, the wealth, and it choked out the word. See, worry chokes out faith. You see what I'm saying? It chokes it out. Meaning, literally, if you receive the word in faith, and then begin to walk and worry over and over again, little by little, it chokes it out. That's why the Bible tells us strictly, do not worry or be anxious about some things. No, is that wrong? Oh, anything. See? You better get you, I always say, a, a hard copy. They're changing things all the time online. Millions of articles are being deleted every day. And a lot of the biggest publishers of Bibles aren't really for the gospel. There's only two commentaries I'll ever read if I'm ever reading a commentary. And I want to make sure that when I'm reading it, I want to know who's written it. You see what I'm saying? You got to be careful what you read. Just because you find it in Mardell's doesn't mean anything. I mean, I've been in Mardell's and I've been in aisle five and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then I'm in aisle six, how the gifts have ceased. Aisle seven, that speaking in tongues is for today. Aisle nine, speaking in tongues is of the devil. Where am I at? God's people can't even get together. We can't even agree on the simplest things. Well, as long as we agree on the most important thing. We don't even agree on the most important thing. Now, we do. Praise God. You know, when you preach the fire, the power of the Holy Ghost, when, he, when he's moving through you, you know, people don't want to stay. If you hate the truth, you're going to have a hard time in the church. This church. A lot of churches, you'd just be able to get a blanket and brother sheets would just tuck you in. Man, I've been into some churches and I'm like, man, will you come over to my house tonight? I, it helped me get to sleep. Put you right on down. Sister Pillow and brother sheets, man, they just get tuck you in. I used to sit by a guy. I had to go to church sometimes in Tulsa and look over at me and say, man, he's tucking us in today. That wasn't a good thing. Now, but here's what I want to say. The, the weeds themselves, they always show up in the middle. And this is why most people never obtain the great things God's called them possessed. You see, we always want to talk about the promise. We always want to talk about the possessing. I find it strange. That people want to advance in the things of God, yet they don't want to work. You know? I mean, are they too spiritual to work? Lisa went to Bible school with somebody, and they were blowing up balloons, and 
the guy next, he, he, she said, can you help us blow up balloons? He said he wasn't called to blow up balloons. <laughs> we still, even to this day, every now and then have somebody show up and say, that's not my calling. And I love those people because I just, I'm like, I need a, a good venting session today. And I'm like, you know who laid this carpet in here? Me and Victor. Are we called carpet layers? Uh, who do you think painted the ceilings of the entire building? Me and Victor. Did we ask ourselves, oh, you know, Victor, before we get into this, we need to really ask ourselves the question, are we called to paint? <laughs> you know what we're called to do? What needs to be done. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's what we're called to do. And I'll do it. I've said it again. I'll work out any, any pastor. If there was a show on TV, who's the hardest working pastor, I'd sign up. And I don't say that to boast. I say that, that it wouldn't be hard to win because most of them don't work. Yeah, you tell you. My dad tell you. He saw it all. I'm telling you. My dad gave me a valuable lesson when I was growing up. And... The thing about my father was what he spoke would change you if you received it. It'd make you bitter if you didn't. And I remember every morning we'd get there at church at 8 and we'd pray from 8 to 9. My dad would always say the same thing. Uh, Boys, boys, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to see you pray. I want to hear you pray. Okay. So you know. Well, anyway, when I started working at the church, I was 18, and it was uh, it was a completely supernatural thing. Because if you had met me when I was 17, you would have laughed at the idea of what I did when I was 18. Um, when I was in class, I've said this, said this before, when I was in class and I would read in high school, I'd stutter. And once I got up to preach, never stuttered. And it was like, I, 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 never, I, I, didn't, I didn't get like formal training as what the people would say, but I had the best training in the world. Number one, I was called to do it. That's the first thing you got to figure out. Are you called to do it? You know what I mean? The second thing, I, I was raised under a pastor, right? So I remember one day I was at uh, work and I was walking down the hallway and my dad came in the back door. I'd, and then I'd been working for maybe five years or six years or whatever there. And some guy... I'm just going to call him Guy, and joked around with my dad, which to me, joking's not always bad, but you can always, if you can discern, you can, you can discern the tone of their heart and what they're saying. And I remember just kind of standing in the hallway, I don't know what I was doing, and he kind of made a joke. And when people make jokes with my dad, I always know what's coming. The guy, he worked at the church, he said, Pastor, I see you're here. We're supposed to be here at nine. And I was like, oh, God, no. No. And that day, my dad taught me something, and I remember seeing it. Hey. Come here. And my dad would always give me this wink before he was about to give somebody the truth. He'd always go. If I get here tomorrow at 1 p.m., don't worry about where I'm at. 
you just make sure you're here at nine. Well, well, the man with the gold makes the rules. And I remember hearing that and like, now you take some people, they've been like, oh, how dare he? And what he said was absolutely wholeheartedly biblical. My dad walked in authority, was the pastor of the church. You take a peanut who's put four years in, he's put 40 in, right? All I'm saying is nobody wants to hear that lesson. And I remember from that day, I'm, you know, I always, when I worked at my dad, I always wanted to be on time. Because I felt like if I was late, I was disrespecting the pastor. See, at church he was my pastor, at home he was my father, and on the golf course he was my friend. And if you'll notice the difference between the hats that you, you wear and other people wear, God will advance you a lot quicker. Now, I'm saying all this because there are things that I learned in the ministry, things that were most, the most vital, but one of the greatest things I ever learned, and, and it wasn't at, it was at a, sometimes a tough expense, that there are going to be weeds that will try to choke out my advancement. And it's one of the most frustrating things. Because we always want to talk about the promise. We always want to talk about possessing. But we don't want to talk about the pruning and the patience in order to get there. You know, we don't. The promises of God are yes and amen. Well, they are. They're yes. But they come through obedience. There is no blessing of God that's not conditional. They're all conditional. Well, no, they're not. Salvation, you're wrong. With your heart, you believe. With your mouth, you confess. You have to do something. You have to believe. Now, you will never obtain the promise if you don't possess the patience. This is a middle message. I could talk about the promise, and I could talk about the possessing, and you might be frustrated for the next 10 years because you don't realize you're in the middle. Job chapter 42, verse 12 says, So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. And I'm telling you, people will buck dance and shout, and they will amen that right there, but our shout will actually be foolish if we don't understand how the blessing was obtained. You know, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Every time Jesus did something in someone's life, he said, your faith, your faith, your faith. But we have, we have, have a replacement theology where it's no longer, it's not really my faith. He just didn't want to do it. You know, I really, I mean, if that's not the case, then there are a lot of things in here that are a lie. And if you find one scripture in here is a lie, then it's all a lie because God says he cannot lie. Right? See, we look at the scripture, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. And all we focus on is the rewarder, but not the diligently seeking. It's a middle. It's a middle game. Now, check this out. Are you tonight willing to lose it all in order to get everything he has for you? Now, we've, I mean, really, that's something you need to think about. Because you, might, you might not understand the consequences of everything. Sure, yes, everything. But then the moment everything's stripped... You want to give up, but you said he could take everything. Everything. And a lot of times, most of the time, what he calls you to do, where he tells you to go, will not make a lick of sense to anybody around you. It won't. And so if you're seeking approval for his assignment, you'll never follow his assignment. Because those that have approved of you will 
disqualify you from chasing after what they never obtained. You see? So I think it like this. Until everything in your life is considered nothing. And I mean everything. Your family, your friends, your accounts, your acceptance. Until you say, it doesn't matter anymore. I want to do what you want me to do. We say yes to that. Just like everybody says yes to Weight Watchers on January 1st, and they have said no on the 9th. The Bible says count the cost. Count the cost before you build. For if you start building and you're not able to finish it, people will think you're foolish. So count the cost. And so this is, this is one of the most vital things to receiving the promises of God. And I'm going to use myself as a personal illustration. How do you make sense of someone, and you got to be careful with this, because people will say you have everything. They don't know what you have. Anytime you have more than them, they say you have everything. But they have nothing, so what do you have? You see what I'm saying? You have everything, and you leave everything to go after what doesn't exist. There's nothing. When I left my father's church, people thought I was mentally deranged. But see, God had been equipping me for the last 15 years. Because since day one, I was always a problem in regards to I said things that probably most would think ought not to be said. But I always found that funny because it was the word of God. If the word of God says it, I'm going to say it, right? So I step out, I leave my dad's. Now, why wouldn't I stay at my dad's, take over my dad's church, and not go through the middle. You know? Because see, people have asked me that question. Why didn't you just stay at your dad's? It's kind of like when you were driving a Bentley and then you got an 83 Accord, like, hey, why didn't you just keep the Bentley? But they don't know what was in the trunk of the Accord. You see what I'm saying? So, why would you do that? Why didn't you just skip through and go all the way to possessing the promise? But see, they're assuming that that was the, my promise. Because they're assuming that if it's bigger and if it's better, then it obviously means it's of God. Right? But this is where people go wrong. If you skip the middle, you won't be able to hang on to the promise. It's what you learn in the middle that makes you Velcro to the provision and promise that he sends to you, right? So this was really confusing for me because it wasn't until last year that God actually answered my question that I've been asking for eight years. God, I know you called me to do this. I've talked with Pastor Paul about this many times. God, you called me to do this. I know you did, but why? I mean, because you can always answer the question because, there, yeah, there could be another church, but why? Why here? Why not somewhere else? Why so close? Why this? And in the last two years, the Lord, if you stay with the Lord and you don't walk out in the middle, he'll eventually show you why the middle exists. And you will be like, oh my gosh. He'll never show you when he gives you the promise. He wants you to go through the middle because of obedience, not because of a revelation that's going to come after the middle's over. So, so I think it was like a year and a half, two years ago. 
The Lord said, if I had never brought you out, you would have never developed the faith that you have now to pursue what I've called you to go after. And that is the middle. And, 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 and so this is why you have a lot of fraudulent believers. Because they have gone from what they would say, the promise to possessing, but there's no character in their possessing. It's fraudulent. You know what I mean? They have a, a, a bread, but it's stale. You know, you, you, it, it's a TED talk. Right? I don't want to be in a church where there's not hunger. If there's not hunger, I'm going to go find hungry people. Because I'm a hungry, hungry hippo. Right? So I got tired like three years ago. And Victor was there, and I said, man, I've had enough of this. I said, I ain't going to. Actually, it was five years ago. I said, I'm not going to be nobody's circus clown. And I'm not going to build a church on convenience. I'm not going to build church on what people want to hear. I'm going to preach what they need to hear. Now, here's what's interesting. When you start doing what God has called you to do, you get the opposite results of success. And so everybody shows up and says, well, you might need to change because everybody's going to the door and leaving. But it never occurred to them that what God was bringing, these needed to leave so that new fruit could come in. That's not anybody. No one ever thinks about it. No one ever thinks about it. So don't look at all the things that you think you've lost as you've lost. Your losing has actually made you a prerequisite for gaining what God wants to give you in the name of Jesus. And I'm surrounded by people like that. Pastor Paul, you were down to nothing. And you didn't ask for that. No one asks for the middle. No. But you find yourself there. And when you find yourself there, and you don't just go through one middle. There's many middles. But you, you find yourself there, and you, you begin to... Because, see, when I was at, at, at Justin and Candace's the other day, me and, and Peachy... We're playing house in the backyard, and we're having a tea party. And she said, I'm going to cook you a meal. Now I'm going to take a little longer, and I want you to be upset. I'm be like, that'll be easy. <laughs> so <laughs> she wanted me to yell at the chef, and her little brother was the, I said, you know, was the chef, and so all this stuff. <laughs> now, would you, like, check my, my mental stability if I said that that was real, you'd be like, that's a little strange. Because it was playing house. And that's what it is when you play church. You can have the right pieces. Yeah. You can have things set up. You can have your flower arrangements and your carpet or whatever they do out there nowadays. And you can have all of that. You can have choirs. I mean, think about it. The Mormons have an enormous choir. Yet, unless they change, they'll be singing in hell. It's a cult. Like, I don't even know. Like, today you've got to explain that to Christians. And I'm all like, you need to sit on the bench for a while and learn the word before you get up and play anymore. You're, you're, you're making all of us look bad. You, you, you can't even do a layup, man. Sit down for a little bit. So, so, you know, and I find it interesting. Notice how the devil, you don't hear anything about the Mormon finances or the Catholic finances. But once you get a Holy Ghost church, that's all you hear about. It's the money. It's the money. There's like $2.3 trillion worth of assets in the Vatican. No one says anything. They have their own freaking city. Their own city. Right. 
The Mormons have $32.6 billion in a stock portfolio. Which makes you think. Pretty smart move for a church that doesn't have to pay capital gains tax. Yet no one says anything. No one cares because the devil isn't going to draw your attention to something that's false. It's like I was talking to a sweet young lady last night and she was talking about, I just have worried that I'm not saved. And I said, well, Jesus is the Lord of your life, right? She's like, yes. So I said, well, then I guess none of us are. And she got this smile on her face. And I said, can I ask you a question? She said, sure. I said, do you really think that the devil's going up to people who aren't saved and telling them, you're not saved? No, because they would seek salvation. He's only going to the people that are saved and trying to get them to doubt what God's doing in their life. And so the middle is a place where we find our miracles. It really is. I have found more miracles in the middle. I have found more midnight checks in the middle. I have found more bursts of supernatural strength in the middle. I've had the greatest praise and worship sessions in the middle. See, if you neglect spring training, you can't play in the summer. You know? And so it's it's like, The miracle, and there's miracles all around, but I'm just saying in the middle, you begin to really see that he is a provider. There's something that gets you to believe. It's his word. It's him performing his word. You know, we see him move. He moves the mountains, and I believe. I'll see him do it again. There's churches that sing that don't believe in healing. What mountain has he moved? You don't believe in like that any of that stuff happens anymore. Like I've seen dry bones rattling again. Pentecost. They don't believe in speaking in tongues. But they sing it. I'm like, what is this? What is this? We called them in high school wanksters. They were wannabe gangsters. What up, cuz? What up, gangsta? <laughs> My dad used a word last night that blessed me. Um, he was talking about relationships. And he was talking about what the women saying. He's like, you know, like some of you are like, come on, blood. That, that was street, dad. You did a good job. Good job. Huh? You did. My dad, who did? Okay, how many in here, honestly, because this might not be a good illustration, but honestly, you've seen the movie South Central. Raise your hand if you've honestly seen it. Okay, some people, okay. Well, there's this, and I told you about it on Sunday. There's this guy in there named Ray Ray, and they have a gang called the Double Deuces. So I used to always kind of, you know, do that with my dad. And like for like three years, my dad would come out on the stage before he preached, and he'd look over at me and go, He'd do the double deuces. And I was like, and all my friends were like, <sighs> and it probably wasn't good sometimes because it probably was endorsing their lifestyle a little bit. But <laughs> what you acquire in the middle is what gives you the ability, like I said, to hold the very thing he's called you to possess. It's in the middle that your faith is forged. It's in the middle you discover who you are in him. It's in the middle that you learn 
to ignore the weeds. If you can't ignore the sound of hell, you won't make it. There is one thing I've been accused of over and over again. They say, you just don't seem to care. And I'm like, absolutely. I, 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 I don't care. But, but, but do you know what they're saying about you? And I'm like, do you know what he's saying about me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. It don't matter. Now, 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 now. You will never find what you're made of until you come face to face with the middle. What if Joseph never had a middle? What if he never had a pit? See, everybody wants to talk about the palace, no one wants to talk about the pit. And the thing is, Joseph had a middle. But I'm going to tell you, there's something we can learn from Joseph. And that is, your attitude in the middle will either cause you to experience a miracle or a mess. What's your attitude when everything's breaking against you? What's your attitude when people are... are saying hateful things about you? What's your attitude when you're writing another job application? What's your attitude in the middle? Because I'm going to tell you, most people's attitude, they forfeit themselves from advancement. And what you don't pass in the middle keeps you in the middle. And until you pass it or turn back, you'll have to keep going through it because God says, I can't take somebody to the promise if they're worried about what people are saying. Look at Paul, look at Jesus, look at Moses, look at Abraham, look at Isaac, look at Jacob, look at Daniel, look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you think they gave two cents about what anybody said? And you know, the board would have gotten rid of Moses when he came off the mountain and broke the tablets. We can't have an angry pastor. But see, that's the thing. He wasn't angry. I mean, he saw everybody making idols. God didn't want him to break those tablets. He had to end up chiseling himself. Now, your attitude. And we say this, and this is something I, I, I'll listen to things repetitively. Because I, I, I want to be honest with myself if I've gotten it or not. And I can check myself throughout the day and whether I've gotten it or not. Well, but still haven't got it. I need to go listen to it again. I'll talk to myself. What are you doing, John? You get your act together, man. We don't act like this. Your attitude in the middle will either cause you to become a victim or victorious. You know, a victim is a puny spirit that, that, that makes crawling normal. You know? See, you can't have freedom and victimization at the same time. You can have one or you can have the other. A victim says, look what you did while, no, while, while, while not applying evidence for what happened. Not all the time. I'm not talking about if you were a victim in rape. You know what I mean? Please understand that. I'm talking about a spirit of people that walk around as victims and nothing has ever happened to them. They are victims because they want pity. And because they seek pity, they'll never get praise. They'll never walk in it. 
I inhabit the praise of my people. We say this all the time, not the pity of my people. But we want pity, feel sorry, look at... And so what people, what victims do is they find other people to endorse their victimhood. Victims never surround themselves with anybody that will ever speak the truth. They will only speak what the person, the victim, wants to hear so that they can remain and so that they can basically say, hey, let's just seal this up. You're the victim, and I feel sorry for you. And if you feel sorry for a victim, you will be the victim's best friend. <laughs> it's a spirit. And it, and it gets in the church and it ends up on the stage. You know, one thing about my dad is I wasn't raised under a feminine pastor. And I see a lot of pastors today, I'm like, is that lisp natural? That's a lisp, right? That's, I mean, you, have, you don't have a space between your teeth or anything. That's, that's, that's a feminine talk. Those are feminine attributes. The Bible's clear and explicit that men shouldn't be feminine. And you want to know why the church isn't filled with men. Because men, real men, Don't want to be a part of something that's fraudulent. And I find it interesting that how is it that unbelieving men are coming into church and are more discerning than the people in the house that claim to be believers? Ooh, I didn't know we were going to go this direction. I really didn't. But going back to this, because this is what I want you to know. In the middle, you will meet your victim who claims to be a victim, and they will suck you dry. They will want all your time and all your attention, and like they tried to do to Nehemiah, they'll try to get you off your wall and talking to them. Your job is to not fix people's problems. Your job is to give people the word, but you can't fix anybody. So when, once somebody deems you their fixer, you become their God, which is out of place. Right? So a victim wants all your time, and a lot of times they'll show up with things that you need. And if a victim shows up with things you need, you will definitely endorse their victimization so that you can get what's in their hand. But once you take from them, you have now joined hands and become a victim yourself. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving on, but I just think this is so important to understand because as the church, we have to protect the house from pity. Jesus never felt sorry for anybody. He had compassion for people. He loved people, but not pity. Pity and sympathy don't free somebody from bondage. It endorses their bondage. So, so I, I, I want to, before I move on to the next point, Dad, I promise I'll, I'll be done. You can't go get a sub yet. <laughs> but, but, but. So, what do you like? What do you like the sub? Oh. Huh? Okay. I have no idea what that means, Dad. Uh, be honest with you. No idea. <laughs> so, so, so here's the deal. Don't let the enemy deceive you into thinking that you're negative when you're calling darkness what it is. I find it interesting that people want to go from negative to nice when they're never truthful. And so they deem, well, we can't be negative, we need to be nice which it's not really either or, you need to be truthful. Amen. But when you speak truth, the consequences come. Right. 
and but 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 God won't honor you. God, and we always talk about you know like drunkenness and, and homosexuality, but they're, they're lying is a big deal. So we speak the truth and we speak it all the way through the middle. Let me go to the next point. When we look at the Old Testament and we compare it to Christ's life, the first thing anyone should expect as they follow God's plan is trouble. I looked it up. It costs something to be unique. It costs something to be peculiar. It costs something to succeed. It costs something to produce quality. It even costs you something to be you, who God created you to be. And where in all the word of God have we ever seen someone blessed or promoted who did not go through trouble? And if you're not willing to fight for your purpose, you're not worthy to obtain the prize. What God, I said last night, calls you to do, you will never find on sale. You'll never find any bargains for it. There are no shortcuts. And this is why you need the power of the Holy Ghost every single day. Let me tell you something. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. It does. Now, if we're going to shout to that, we can't cry on Tuesdays. Nothing wrong with crying, but it shouldn't be at the expense because you don't think you have power. We can shout to this, but will we walk in this? The Holy Ghost for the last, I'm telling you, I'm just going to get, it's been more than this. I'm going to say for the last 10 years has been charging me up every single day. I don't have hobbies. I don't go out and do a bunch of stuff. I am so, this is all I know. This is what God has called me to do. I've missed five Sundays in 10 years, and it's not because of any other reason, but God said, if you don't want to be my mouthpiece, I said, well, God, what about them? They took an eight-week vacation. You're not them, and they're not getting what I'm giving you. So, nothing wrong with taking a break, but there are times for vacation. There are times for working. There's a season for everything. Sowing and reaping and laughing and crying. There's a season for everything. And if you don't know what season you're in, you won't know what to do where you're at. You might think that you're in a transitional season, but you're in a disciplined season. You might think you're in an advancing season, but you're in a learning season. And if you don't know where you're at, you won't seek after what you need. Know what season you're in. We made no mistakes about it. For five years, I told the staff, we're not going to grow. Wait a minute. That sounds really depressing. We're going to lose people. Oh, oh, oh. None of them acted like that. They don't act like that. They're all soldiers. We're, we're all, there are no whiners. We, we, it's not like Pastor John is strong. We're all operating in boldness and authority. And we all knew what page we were on. And when God tells you you're not going to grow, see, you don't get discouraged in the middle. When God tells you, hey, there's not going to be a lot of advancement right now. It's coming, but don't expect it. I need to work some stuff out. And when you know that, you're not suicidal. But you won't know that if you don't listen through the Holy Spirit. If all you're looking for is fruit and fruit and fruit, you'll be fruity. Real fruity. And we're going to get to that here in a minute. Don't sell your calling in the dips. Don't cash out when things get low. You only lose when you leave. Stay in it. And you'll, get great, you'll do great exploits for God. You only lose when you leave. 
You only lose when you walk away. It might seem like you have lost more than you had in the beginning, but let me, you're looking through natural eyes. For, for a long, long time, Corey, you can attest this. I can look around this room and people can testify to what I'm saying. We knew we were going forward and everybody thought we were crashing. So if we're worried about our public opinion, we would have been in obedience or disobedience to God. This actually happened when we had three services and God told us to go to one service. And we knew we'd, I said, God, we're going to lose people. We're going to lose money. He said, yes, you will lose both. But did I ask you if I care? I said, no, I, no you, I, know, I know you don't. <laughs> you haven't seemed to care for quite some time. <laughs> I said, okay. We went to one service. And, and, and this is how the weeds happen. See, the weeds are not only there to choke you, they're there to make fun of you. Because you planted. And they're like, hey, he really didn't plant. And, and not only are they making fun of you, they're mocking you because they're planting right next to your seed. The only problem is they didn't plant deep enough. Now check it out. People around town, and I don't even know how this gets out. Like, we're in a storefront building. Why would anybody be threatened by this building? There's a church across town, 15,000 people. And for some reason, they find it interesting to talk about us in their staff meetings. Like, what in the world? Now, I know why we're threatening them. We, we preach the truth. Amen. That's threatening to people. Amen. You know? Especially people that have churches where trannies pass the offering buckets. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Now, if your mom's a trans, I love you, but she needs deliverance. Amen. And if I don't preach the truth about lying, if I don't preach the truth about drunkenness, if I don't preach the truth about envy and strife, and if I let all those things go, everybody, there are many things, but those are one thing you need deliverance from. But the reason we preach against it is because the world is trying to normalize it amongst our teens and amongst our children, and we're not going to let it happen. I find it funny. That, that I'm the one that gets, gets in trouble, yet the people who are telling the teens and the children that it's okay if you're a boy, you can be a girl, the church isn't getting mad at them. They're getting mad at me saying you are who God called you to be. Oh, there it goes, the cranking of the engine. Okay, I'll be good. I've been good tonight. I've been good. I've been good. Hmm. There was a guy here. You know what people say? There are miracles that happen. Religious people don't get these. Religious people are just foul. Pastor Paul, I don't know if I've told you this. But you know how we always talk about, you know, miracles are also a sign to the unbeliever. Speaking in tongues is. I have heard this more in the last three weeks than I've ever heard it. We have people coming here that are unbelievers. And you, you, you know what started to get them to believe in God? They said, something has to be in this place. For people to sit and listen that long. That's what they said. And here's also what they said. I thought I was, this is an unbeliever. I thought I was only in there for 45 minutes. And it was four hours. Now, it, now, now you have a problem when the unbeliever is endorsing a move of God, but the religious are trying to stomp it out. That's a problem. Now, you better be careful. You better be careful. People, you don't want to take, don't, don't. Shut up. Like, we're going to do what God's called us to do. And so here's the thing. Let's say we keep doing what God has called us to do. And we don't get the results that we want to get. 
you keep doing what God has called you to do. See? Okay, my last thing, and I close. <sighs> what time does Mr. Yero's close? <laughs> sure love that. Yero sandwich. That extra hummus and tzatziki sauce. Ooh. You know, every time you walk in, they have like pictures of grease and stuff. I'm like, where are we? And so, never attach, or I say, never get attached to the season you are in, or you will miss the season that's to come. We fall in love with seasons. And we're like, oh, we build monuments to seasons. You guess what? 2020 was great. But it's over. We don't forget what God did, but there's more that he wants to do. See, God is the one that promoted you in your season. Don't make that season a God. I end with this, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. Any gardeners in the house tonight? Anybody? You like to garden a little bit? Okay. Lisa is uh, my mom. My mom, I used to help you with, uh, what is it, the little plastic siding sometimes. You kind of taught me how to plant flowers and growing up and we do mulch. And, 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 and so you always had beautiful, you always had beautiful flowers and all that kind of stuff. So, so, so it says here that, that I'm the true grapevine, but my father is the gardener. There's a difference between being the vine and the gardener. The gardener is the one that cuts. He cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit. That's number one. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more fruit. So there's two things there. And I wouldn't get upset about either one. But we really get upset about the second one and a lot of times the first one. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is served from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. So the vine dresser is in charge of caring for the vines. And Jesus said that this is the work of the Father. He's the one who what? He, 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 he purges, he prunes the branches so they will produce more fruit. Now, note, notice the progression here. John chapter 15, 2, there's no fruit. And then there's more fruit. And then there's much fruit, John 15, 5, 15, 8. Many Christians, they're praying that God will make them more fruitful, but they do not enjoy the pruning process that follows. I want to be fruitful, but don't cut me. Lie to me and tell me I'm fruitful. Give me fake fruit. So so, so the vine vine dresser prunes the branches in two ways. He, He cuts away the dead wood that can breed disease in insects. So if God doesn't cut what doesn't belong, you'll be infected. But then you actually get used to the infection, and we call it, we normalize it, but it's dysfunction. He cuts away the living tissue so that the life of the vine will not be, or will not be so dis, like dissipated that the quality of the crop will be jeopardized. God doesn't want you to get to the place to where there's no turning back. And if we can begin to understand this, because notice 
that Jesus did not say he pruned some of the fruit branches that bear fruit. He said he cuts back every fruit bearing branch. You got to understand that when God prunes you, it's not because you did something wrong. It's because you have a place to go. Yeah. Just because God takes something doesn't mean you made a mistake. He can't give you something. See, a lot of times God will give us something and then take it if we cling to it too much. And when God prunes you, know that you are part of a select group of people who have been chosen by the vine dresser to be pruned because you've done something that other branches have not. You have fulfilled your purpose. He prunes the branches that is serving their purpose. Isn't that interesting? We don't normally look at it that. We usually think that the things that get taken away is because we're not accomplishing our purpose. But if you weren't, then fruit wouldn't be growing. But if you don't cut back what's growing, you will hinder the new growth, the greater growth. Now, when you go through a pruning season, you are tempted. I have been tempted to focus on what was lost. But let me ask you the, the, uh, the question that I ask myself. Is what you really lost that valuable? Is security valuable when you don't have sanity? You know, I've thought about this. Like there's people, they, they have a $5,000 bed yet they never get good sleep. Never do. Now, we want to focus on what's been taken, what's been pruned, but God is trying to take you to a greater place and you can't get there with yesterday's weights. What got you promoted in the last season has become a weight in a new season. And you got to rid yourself of it. And could it be that the things we deem as valuable are actually taking away from our value? So, in pruning your life, remember this entire message tonight if you've listened as I spoke last night at the end God is wanting to build something great in your life this week and the building process when God's building me there's moments of praise moments of laughter moments of rebuke moments of correction Moments of resting, moments of sitting. And in pruning you, the Lord is assisting you in trimming your life down to carry only what you need to get to where he's called you to go. Because he knows, oh, he knows that the blessing of last season's harvest can become a trap and a graveyard for your future. Mm. If you can trust God when everything's falling apart without looking, see your trust doesn't come from looking where resources are coming from. It's trusting knowing God, I know you're going to make a way. When there seems to be no way, you're going to make a way. And so I ask you tonight, are you willing to leave behind yesterday's fruit so you can embrace the wine of tomorrow's new season? God has something. And, and, I, and I, I have to, the Lord has to rebuke me times. Do you think this is all? 
I told you I wasn't going to turn it off. I know you said it. You don't believe it. You're right. I don't. Because every now and then I remember the middle. And I don't want to go back to the middle. See, you haven't been in the middle if you haven't come to the place that I almost didn't make it out. See, when I can say that, my reliance is if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have made it out. And that is why the middle exists. The middle exists so you can die. So you can die. Till you become so numb, not to the spirit, but to this world. Numb to this world, alive in Christ. And you, you can't do anything. You can't do a single thing to take away what God is doing in my life. And that's how you need to be and what you need to say in your life. I was in the middle. But sometimes God says, I'm not turning it off. The Lord told me that. And I've said it many times, but it was probably, I don't know, Victor, what was it, like two months ago? I was up here praying in the Holy Spirit on our Saturday. We have Saturday night prayer. And it's not a come together and kumbaya, like we, we get after it in Jesus' name. And our church is where it's at because of those prayer nights. Everything that's happened has been birthed in those prayer nights. And God said, son, how big are your baskets? I said, well, I, I don't know. He said, they're not big enough. I was like, well, then I'll go find some bigger ones. You won't be able to find big enough baskets. And the Lord told me what I'm turning on right now. He told me April 2nd, 2018. But then we actually began to see it. We were week to week every single year for nine years. And every week selling tools and lights to make ends meet. God, this is what you call me to do. I know it's what I called you to do. Keep selling it. Well, God, I said I'd provide. Well, you got a DeWalt drill there, don't you? Sell it. See, a lot of times we want God to bless us without us being a fool. I had people come and buy tools for me that left two weeks later and just ran me down. They got a good deal on a tool. I'm a fool, God. No, you're not. He said, what I'm going to do in this house is back 2018. Nobody will be able to comprehend. And we, to 19, went through 18. Where's it at? Went through 19. Where's it at? And in 2020, think of this. This should strengthen your faith tonight. When almost every church in our city and still right now is in utter decline, the churches that had everything they needed that wouldn't help us out when we asked them, can you help us? They're like, no, we don't. We can't do it. We needed to use their parking lot. No, we, you, you can't use it. Churches that probably bring in five, ten million dollars a year wouldn't help us. And who would have known that they were the ones lining up for a government loan? Who would have known 
that right now they can't stop the bleeding, but we can't stop the blessings. Hallelujah! That God will provide that if you stay the course, they might laugh at you now, but if you'll stay in your middle, if you'll keep going through and keep walking through and not give up, and no matter the valley that you're in, if you say, God, I'm going to keep going. This is what you call me to do. I know it doesn't make any sense. I know people think I've lost my mind, but God, I know you told me to do this. Listen to me. You will get through that middle and you will enter into a promise and you will possess it in the name of Jesus. tell that story when I'm 80 years old. I'm going to keep telling that story to my boys. They counted your daddy out. But my daddy never counted me out. Hallelujah. And I pray tonight whatever thing God's called you to do, don't you be discouraged for one moment. Don't you be discouraged for one minute. If you will understand that the moment hell comes against you is the sign that blessings are coming after you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet with me this evening. Let's lift our hands. God, I thank you tonight. tonight that we are leaving here walking, leaping and praising God oh thank you Holy Spirit thank you Holy Spirit Lord I thank you right now that a spirit of encouragement is coming on us Lord I thank you right now that we are moving forward, there are people in here right now that when they came in here they wanted to give up but right now They've never had more determination to go forward in what you've called them to do than right now. And Lord, I thank you in the name of Jesus that mighty blessings, oh Lord, I thank you, are overtaking this church, are overtaking the people in this church. Lord, I thank you that you told me there's a blessing attached to the people in this church and it's going to run over in their life as last year was a year of multiplication, not only for this church, but for the people in this church, you've also told us that this year is a year of multiplication upon multiplication. And Lord, I thank you that every single person in this house, that Lord, they are overflowing in Jesus' name. There is no lack, there is no need that God, you are providing according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we give you praise right now. We give you honor right now. Lord, we thank you that you're a good God. Right now in your seat, just tell him that he's a good God. Praise him. Praise him in your seat. Cry out. Tell him, God, thank you that I'm coming through. Thank you, God, that I'm more than enough. Thank you, God, that I'm the head and not the tail. the enemy. I don't have to live in discouragement. I don't have to live in depression. I don't have to live in anxiety. I don't have to live in worry and defeat. I'm not an abuse. I am going to be of use in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Let it overflow in our spirits tonight. Let it overflow in our spirits tonight.
you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Oh, thank you, Lord, for doing a work tonight. Oh, the Lord's ministry to some people right now. The presence of God will do what you can't explain. I can't explain it, but something dropped off me tonight. I can't explain it, but that pain isn't there anymore. I can't explain it, but the heaviness that's been on me the last two years has fallen off. I can't explain it. Oh, I can't explain it, but I know where it came from. ministering now. Thank you, Lord, right now. Thank you, Lord, right now. Ministering spirits are going forth in Jesus' name. Every day they're going forth and bringing back a mighty harvest from the north, the south, the east, and the west. This house is running over with hungry people, lost people that'll be found, broken people be put back together. Oh, Lord, those that are sick shall be healed in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, they're wheeling in the wheelchairs. They're leaving the wheelchairs and they're walking out to their car in Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you're going to do and what you're doing in this house no doctor can perform. No counselor can fix. Oh, Lord, I thank you. Hallelujah. I want to see in this house, as we have been seeing the beginnings of it, but I want to see the full manifestation. Now, sometimes you got to be kind of careful because it... it, it, it you know, I've seen more stuff happen in my life when I told the Lord, I, I don't want to just read about it. I want to experience it. Hallelujah. Amen. Tomorrow night, for some of you, will be an eye-opening experience. For me, it'll be a normal What I want to do, seriously, I want you to get in here tomorrow and bring more people with you. And tomorrow night, we're going to shout, we're going to praise. Pastor Derek Fields is going to bring a mighty word from the Lord. And we are going to I'm telling you, not only continue, but on Thursday, the Lord's working some stuff in my spirit for Thursday. And I believe, like I've said, if you know anybody that's sick, somebody else. God will heal you. You ain't got to live like that. I believe God's a healer. Amen. So we're going to see some supernatural things happen on Thursday night, but tomorrow, let's get back in here, and I'm telling you, going to build, 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 but let's leave here encouraged in the Lord tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. I love you guys. Hey, before you dismiss, sit down for a quick second. Yeah, that's right. I about forgot the only pastor in town that has forgotten but we're gonna we're, we're not going we're not gonna leave tonight until we get a chance to give amen there were people last night that told me thank you for giving me opportunity to give and they had it in there I'm telling you you got to understand see this is what's abnormal about this house if we didn't take tithe and offerings people would beat us in the parking lot with wet ropes What's wrong with you? Take my blessing like that. 
There's a blessing attached to your seat. We're giving every night. Lisa and I are giving every night. Well, you cannot probably afford to do so. Is that attitude keep you broke? I don't ask myself if I can afford to do it. God gives me, and we do it. But we give. We're givers, man. You know how we got out ourselves out of debt? By giving. Amen. So let's get ready to give tonight. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give. Lord, I thank you for every person in here. That, Lord, as they give their tithe, their offerings, that you bless them 30, 60, and a hundredfold in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Ushers, go ahead. Pastor Victor, love you, buddy. Hey, we have two more. What happened here? What, what happened it, Paul? We have two more word-a-thons this year. Yes, we do. We have one in the summer and one in the fall. And you know what? I'm believing for one of the word-a-thons this year to just keep going. You know, we're going to do what God calls us to do and tells us to do. You never want to make something happen. You want to let God do the doing. Amen. Some nights, see the Spirit of God. There's a, a, a prophetic, there's a healing, there's preaching, teaching. You just follow what the Lord wants. I would have never, honestly, two weeks ago, if you were to ask me what I was going to preach tonight, I would have never said it would have been this message. See, that's why you can't preach what you want to preach. You got to preach what the Spirit tells you to preach. Amen. And sometimes the Spirit tells you to preach things that are not fun to preach. This was fun to preach, but there are a lot of things that I guess no one else wanted to sign up for those. So I was like, okay, I'll take the assignment. So I love you guys. Thank you. Stand to your feet. Let's, before we leave, say, just, just grab your neighbor's hand one last time. Lord, we thank you tonight for what you've done. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Lord, that we're blessed going in and coming out. Lord, I thank you as they leave here tonight. They leave in the joy of the Lord. As they come back tomorrow, they come back in the joy of the Lord. Everybody said hallelujah. I love you guys. God bless you. Amen.